When you visit the Natural History Museum of Denmark, you meet with only a fraction of the specimens from the museum's collections. Most of the specimens are kept under lock and key in facilities like this. Here, in these boxes, drawers and jars, and on these shelves, we encounter an ordered inventory of the natural world. My name is Juri Witteveen, and I'm a philosopher and historian of science here at the University of Copenhagen. I'm interested in how scientists order natural history collections to mirror the order of the natural world. Names play a central role in creating order. Each plant and animal in these collections is labeled with a name tag. And we owe this two-part structure of names to Carl Linnaeus, the man who led the foundations for modern taxonomy, the science of classifying plants and animals. But not all of these name tags are equal. Most of the labels are white, but some specimens have a red label attached to them, the so-called type specimens. And these are among the most special and valuable specimens in the collections. Whenever a new species is named and described, one specimen is selected to serve as its type specimen. And this specimen comes to serve as the reference standard. So what does this mean, that type specimens are reference standards? Consider an example of another object that serves as a reference standard. The International Prototype Kilogram. Until recently, this small metal cylinder served as the ultimate arbiter for the use of the term kilogram. And the same holds for type specimens. They are securely stored and they are only consulted by experts who need to know for sure that they are using a species name correctly. But there's also an important difference between these two kinds of standards. The kilogram standard strictly defines what a kilogram is, but the features of a type specimen do not exactly define its species. Take this tooth, for example. It is the type specimen of Smilodon populator, better known as the saber-toothed tiger. Now, obviously, this tooth isn't a typical specimen of the entire species, and yet it serves as the type specimen. The same goes for many other type specimens. Plant type specimens, for example, often lose their color and may fall apart over time. And this here is the type specimen of the giant squid. It consists of no more than a few parts that were sent home by the captain who caught it. So clearly, a type specimen doesn't need to be typical of its species. But that may seem puzzling, because if a type specimen isn't typical, how can it serve as a reference standard for the species? And why would we call atypical specimens type specimens to begin with? To answer these questions, we need to turn to the history of natural history collections. Remember Linnaeus? He named hundreds of new plant species, but he was unfamiliar with the idea of a type specimen. <coughs> Linnaeus didn't mind replacing the specimens that he had used to describe a new species with different samples from the same species. And why not? If other specimens better reflected the key features of the species, they would be more useful in telling whether new specimens that entered the collections belonged to the same species or not. And yet, the world of science was about to change in ways that made this practice of replacing original specimens with more typical ones deeply problematic. In the early 19th century, European collections were flooded with new specimens from voyages and expeditions overseas. And around the same time, the number of men and women that started practicing taxonomy was also on the rise. And with more people studying what were sometimes only slightly varying specimens, disputes arose about where and how to draw the lines between species. To see how this impacted the naming of species, consider this simplified example. Imagine that we found this specimen and used it to name and describe a new species. We attach a label to it with a species name on it and store it in our collection. But then we encounter a specimen that we think is more exemplary of the same species. We throw out the original specimen 
and replace it with the new one. Sometime later, a flood of new and slightly varying specimens arrive, and other people join us in thinking about how we should group these specimens into species. Now, imagine that some of these people suggest that these specimens actually belong to two distinct species. This raises the question, which of these is the original species and which is the newly identified one for which we need to come up with a new name? If we take the labeled specimen from our collection as our guide, we will be inclined to use the original species name for the species on the right. However, this means that we are now using this name for a different species than the one to which we first applied it. So, one could say that this name has now drifted from one species to another. In principle, there was no limit to this drifting of names. Whenever a specimen was replaced with a more typical one and species boundaries were redrawn, a species name could float away further from the species for which it had originally been used. This was a recipe for chaos and confusion. It meant that the same name could refer to completely different species at different times and for different people. Clearly, something needed to be done. And the red labels showed the way out of the chaos. In hindsight, the solution was quite obvious. If the problem was that names would start drifting, the solution would be to anchor them. And the most obvious place to throw out the anchor for a species name was with the specimen that was first used to name it. As long as this specimen was preserved, the species name would remain securely anchored to the original species, regardless of how ideas about classification might change later on. The reason for calling these red labeled specimens type specimens wasn't that they had to be typical or complete, but only that if there was a choice between specimens, the most typical or complete specimen would be the best choice. So we can think of these red labels and the specimens they're attached to as passports, as the official identity documents of the species. When your passport picture becomes outdated, showing your younger self, the passport nevertheless remains valid. And the same goes for type specimens. They secure the identity of their species, even if they are no longer typical of them. So now we have an answer to the question, what makes these red labeled specimens particularly special and valuable? The answer is that they are the custodians of species, names and identities. They provide stability to the names of plants and animals against the background of disagreements about how to order the natural world.